Hi, I'm Jack. Welcome to Fragments of Cinema. This video will focus on the movie Waking Life, which was written and directed by Richard Linklater. Waking Life is a very experimental film, and it's really hard to categorize because of this. Just a quick glance at Wikipedia will illustrate the problem. It's named as an experimental philosophical adult animated docufiction film. And ironically, that is actually pretty accurate. As you can imagine from the category, Waking Life is a very thick movie. It has a lot of dialogue and a lot of complex abstract thoughts. It really oozes information from left and right. Because of this, I won't analyze everything in the film since that would take a lifetime. I will only focus on what actually happens in it and how the film is able to provoke philosophical thinking in any viewer. I've broken the film down into three main sectors, which I'll soon elaborate. One, it's rotoscoped. Two, the majority of the film consists of 37 different episodes. And three, we only have one main character, the dreamer. The first one is the most obvious one, the animation, the rotoscoping. Rotoscoping is an animation technique where animators paint over live action footage. As you can see, rotoscoping results in an animation which roughly approximates the images actually filmed. Richard Linklater used a different animator for almost every scene. This resulted in a wide variety of visual styles. You have a lot of animation which is very alive, some is very static, some are impressionistic. With each episode we see a new style. Now try to remember this since I'll get back to it at the end of the video. The second most apparent thing in the film are the episodes. The episodes are mainly discussions or monologues of side characters. They range from encounters with philosophers and mystics to political ranting and glimpses of psychopathic fury. All of you pukes are gonna die the day I get out of this shithole! Two topics continuously pop up in the conversations, free will and determinism. Free will is the ability to choose between different possible courses of action without any obstructions. In short, it's the ability to choose freely. Now determinism is somewhat the opposite. It's a theory that all events are completely determined by previously existing causes. A good example of deterministic thinking is the idea of destiny. Forces larger than us make things happen for a reason. The third most visible thing in the film is the main character, the dreamer. He's the character who's present in all of the episodes. The entire film is actually the character's dream. He doesn't seem to have any control of the dream. The events and episodes simply happen to him. The film starts off with the main character as a child and he starts to float upwards to the sky. He's able to stop the floating by holding onto a car handle. The film progresses and it ends in a very opposite manner. The character once again starts to float, and this time he floats all the way into the sky. Now in order to understand what all of this means, let's take a deeper look into the world of the film. Like I said, the entire film is the main character's dream. Uh, dreaming as a concept is very vague, so let's start off by defining what dream really means in the world of the film. Now luckily for us, the film explicitly defines it in the beginning. Dream is destiny. Okay, this is still very vague, but let's connect this with the idea of free will and determinism. Since free will is the ability to choose freely, a dream is quite the opposite. A dream simply happens. The dreamer rarely has any freedom over it since it's an act of the subconscious mind. One could say that the absence of free will makes dreaming a deterministic setting. A larger force, that being the unconscious mind, controls the fate of the dreamer. So the main character is in a dream which we've established to be a deterministic place, a tunnel. A turning point in the film is when the character realizes he's in this dream. He tries and tries to wake up from it, but he can't. In a sense, he's trying to impose his free will in the flow of determinism. Since he can't break it, since he can't wake up, he starts to think he's dead. I keep waking up, but, but I'm just waking up into another dream. I'm starting to think that I'm dead. He tries asking the final dream character how to get out of the dream. The final character is actually the director and he gives a long monologue to the dreamer. In short, the director says that time is an illusion and that existence is only one instant. He argues that within every instant, God is posing a question. A question on whether do we want to merge with him, merge with eternity. And we keep saying no because we want to exist within time. 
A link later emphasizes that everyone will eventually have to say yes to God's invitation, but he explicitly does not say that one has to die in order to do this. Immediately after the conversation, the director tells the dreamer to simply wake up in order for the dream to end. The character seemingly does wake up again, and the second car scene happens. The car handle scenes have a pretty direct meaning now, especially since Licklater's monologue happens right before it. The dreamer was saying no to God's invitation in the beginning, but in the end he says yes, and merges into eternity by floating into infinite space. So what changed his answer from a no to a yes? What happened in between? The conversations. The topics discussed in the episodes clearly had an effect on the character. They made him succeed in the ultimate quest, saying yes to God's invitation. The dreamer is able to succeed in this quest in a deterministic setting, the dream. But he does this only after imposing his free will onto it by simply telling himself to wake up. Um, but it's easy, you know, just, just wake up. It even looks like he could hold on to the car handle, but he chooses not to. Linklater is trying to say that determinism and free will can exist at the same time. He's saying that we live in a world where we can't decide the options, but we can choose which one of them we want to pick. It's like you come onto this planet with a crayon box. Now you may get the 8-pack, you may get the 16-pack, but it's all in what you do with the crayons, the colors, that you're given. This is the beauty of mosaic storytelling combined with just the right amount of character attachment. The main character is the only stable element in the film, and we attach to him. We go through this ocean of ideas, we feel through him. Now the ending leaves the character's fate unsure. Is he dead? Did he wake up? What really happened? This results in the only form of attachment being taken away from us. And what are we left with? Once again, we're left with the conversations, the topics discussed in the episodes. This combination of pouring philosophical information onto us and leaving the character's fate completely unknown forces the viewer to latch onto anything he or she remembers from the film. Linklater is inviting us to pick fragments of this pool of ideas he presented. Now this is even evident in the episodes themselves. They refuse to privilege one theory over another. Even the main character won't take any sides. It's mostly just me dealing with a lot of people who are exposing me to information and ideas that seem vaguely familiar, but at the same time, it's all very alien to me. Once you combine this with the animation technique, which is dozens of artists creating many different styles which all look and feel different, it's like the film is simply laying out colorful ideas for two hours, trying to not make one feel better than the other one. Linklater doesn't want to take sides, he's asking us to join him in a sophisticated discussion rather than a blast of opinions. He's implicitly saying that we can choose which of the conversations we want to remember, which ideas make us feel the strongest. The film asks us which ideas can you use in order to get from the no to the yes. How will you use the film in your own waking life?